So yeah, I'm uh, Jack and I'm going to be uh, in this uh, first talk going over some of the basic concepts and applications um, for machine learning that we'll be discussing um, in, the, in the more physics based talks um, uh, later in the meeting. So I'm going to be uh, selecting some key uh, and regularly used machine learn learning concepts based on how, um, how, how regularly they're used and give some, uh, some small physics applications, but mainly non-physics applications to really set the scene for the talks we'll be seeing um, later on today. So I'll just give an overview of the of the um, <clears throat> sorry I'll just give an overview of the uh, methods that I'll be covering and please interrupt at any time uh, with questions as we go ahead. So there are different uh, tasks that machine learning is often used um, uh, to perform. Uh, so the first one of these is regression, and so I'll be going over a few different methods of doing regression. So to really set the scene and to connect everything together, I'll talk about the very basic linear regression, which we should know well. And then moving on to how that linear regression can be modified to create neural networks, and then how um, uh, we can have more complicated types of neural networks, such as convolutional neural networks, and the tasks they're used for. Also, uh, classification. So this is um, uh, where you want to perform classification tasks on data, and I'll, the example I'll give will be logistic regression. Uh, also, how we can use machine learning to do compression and find constraints of objects. So I'll be talking about principal components analysis and autoencoders. And finally, if we have time, um, I'll go over some computer vision techniques, for example, doing line detection in images. So each of these four, four cases, we'll go over the common methods and a few simple applications. Um, and um, yes, and also some physics uh, examples along the way. It's worth noting that I've put neural networks in regression here. Some people might complain neural networks can be used for all of these tasks, but I'll just be introducing neural networks from the, from the context of regression. So that was a, a lot of jargon. So let's try to break all of this down. So in deep learning, um, this is essentially generalized regression. So first of all, what is regression? Well, this is modeling the relationship um, between quantities given some data. So if we have some X values and Y values, we want to learn the relationship between these values. So if we have some new X value in the future, we can make a prediction what the Y value would be. And deep learning is essentially generalized regression except in particular, it's for very large dimensional objects, such as images, videos, uh, where you have access to a large amount of computing power, usually via GPUs, uh, a very large amount of data, uh, very large data sets, um, and a very extreme non-linearity in your regression. So the, the map from the inputs to the outputs can be arbitrarily complex. So let's go over the simplest possible example we can imagine first. So if we had just a one dimensional problem, where we have some uh, uh, X quantity and Y quantity with some data points we'd collected from the world. Um, the idea is, is we want to say, well, given this data, we, we have no idea how X depends on Y, but if we could construct a simple model, uh, we could ask given a new uh, X point, what would be the expected value of the Y point we would predict if we observed this new uh, data point. This is the simplest possible example. Um, and one way we could do this is linear regression. So we have our model, which is simply uh, a straight line, a gradient, uh, the input and the y-intercept. And we simply would want to learn uh, the parameters of this model, which is the gradient M and the y-intercept C, such that it most accurately reproduces our data points, XI and YI. So the error is simply a function of the parameters of our model, um, where we sum over all the data points and take the, the difference squared. And so we, um, uh, we can essentially have an iterative model um, based on these gradients. So we use a method, uh, the method that I'll be talking about today is gradient descent, where you simply choose your parameters such that you minimize uh, the error. And this gives you some iterative scheme where you calculate um, the, the gradient of your error uh, with respect to your parameters. And you use this to update the parameters. So uh, on the right, it could look like this. So if we pick one of our parameters, let's say M, the gradient of our, of our model, um, and the, end, the error curve could look something like this. So we start with some random guess for the gradient over here, which has a certain error. And then we use this gradient descent method to simply lower the, uh, 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 keep increasing in the area of lowest gradient to reduce the error. So uh, for our data that I, I showed earlier, it would look something like this. We would have some uh, initial guess uh, of the model. So on the right-hand side is the parameter space of the model, where we have our given chosen parameters. So a gradient of 0.5, uh, sorry, a gradient of zero and a y-intercept of 0.5. And we can see this does not um, give us a low error for the data. 
And then as we perform the gradient descent method on this very simple model, we see we slowly move around in our configuration space and the error uh, between the model and the predicted results gets lower and lower and lower until we arrive at our, um, uh, our model. So we now know the gradient and the y-intercept. So given a new uh, x data point, we can use this to predict the y. So this is very simple. And neural networks are essentially exactly this concept, but just slightly more generalized. So if this concept is, is familiar, then neural networks are also familiar. Okay, so now moving on to neural networks. Well, uh, the first question is, well, what is the, the concept of a neural network? So just like before, we had our data in and then our linear model, which predicted some data out. A neural network is a way where instead of choosing a linear model, or maybe you could you could fit the data with any model you know, so you could pick a polynomial or maybe some Fourier coefficients. But the idea is, is what if you have no idea what the form of your model is? You want to fit some, some curve or fit some model to your data, but the data is of such high dimensions that it really is impossible to predict any form yourself. So for example, this could be the input data, could be the pixels in an image, and the, um, the output data is what... Uh, what is, it, what is in the image. So for example, if you had um, some handwriting, you could say, well, given this, um, this image, what characters, what uh, values are in the image? It's really not obvious. You could pick a simple form for this. We have no idea the dependence um, of the output, which is what is in the image compared to the pixels themselves. So neural networks allow you to make a prediction by propagating the data. So you input your data and out comes some data. And this contains parameters, just like the M and C, that we had in our previous example, the y-intercepts and the gradient, uh, the neural network has many, many more parameters that must be optimized. And we do this by training the model with example input and output data to determine the parameters exactly by the method I just showed. Usually the most common method is by gradient descent. So adjusting the parameters inside the network such that the data are in as closely possible um, reproduces the output data so you can make predictions. So what is a neuron in a neural network? So a neuron is simply, um, as we say, basically a, a, a linear, a generalized linear, uh, linear operation. So before we had the gradient, uh, mx plus c, and now for many inputs to a neuron, it's simply a weighted sum of all the inputs plus some bias. So it's simply a linear combination. So the, the output of the neuron is the linear combination of all the inputs of the neuron with some weights plus a bias. So in this, for example, if we have these three inputs, x0, x1, and x2, we simply multiply it by the three weights, which is represented by these, um, these colors here. So uh, weight zero, weight one, weight two, and the bias. And so on the left, this is the input data. On the right, these are the parameters of the, of the model. And then the bias is represented by the small dot here, which is this. So if we simply take the linear combination of the x0, omega0, uh, x1, omega1, x2, omega2, plus b, uh, we get this value 0.8. Now, in principle, if you connected lots of these together, so you fed this into another neuron and you fed this into another neuron and you did this forever um, for, for, for a very complicated set of neurons, you would still only ever get a linear model because linear models injected into linear models is all linear. There's no, there's no nonlinearity here. So what you do is you apply an activation function, often called sigma, to the output um, of, this whole, of, the, of, the, of this whole sum, um, which injects some nonlinearity. So now applying this, it moves from 0 0.8 to 0 0.66. And that means if you then feed this result into another neuron with also its own activation function, these activation functions are not linear. And so this means that the input and the output can be made arbitrarily nonlinear. So essentially, if you have a neural network and you choose the activation function just to be the, the straight line, then you get back linear regression. And it is the choice of this activation function um, that allows you to inject nonlinearity of your model and then capture any intricacies between the relationship of the input and output data. So what do these activation functions look like where they're just some function of your uh, input? So for example, if the output of your neuron is X, then sigma as a function of X is the new output of your neuron after the activation. Uh, Commonly, one common um, activation function is the sigmoid function that looks like this. Uh, this is convenient because it is it's highly nonlinear and also it gives you values uh, between zero and one. Uh, this isn't so commonly used anymore in uh, image recognition, usually the uh, rectified linear um, activation function, which is simply zero up until uh, x equals zero and then a straight line. Uh, 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 y equals x on the right-hand side is also used, but there are many choices of activation functions. And so the sigmoid function uh, here is one example of that. And so to build a neural network, you simply connect lots of these neurons together. 
So this would be a model that would take uh, four expected inputs and one expected output. And so to make it a prediction using this model, you would get your four uh, input X values and insert them as the values of these neurons. And then the weights, these red and green lines um, are, are, are fixed in the network. And your data would propagate through by doing this linear combination plus activation function, linear combination plus activation function, and so on. until finally you get to your one value, which would be your output value, your predicted value. Um, and if you wanted to train this network, of course, you have all of these uh, uh, these parameters here, these weights in red and green, these would need to be adjusted. But if you have a data set of lots of known X values and Y values, you can use the gradient descent method to um, inform you what these weights uh, are by training the model. Uh, then you can make predictions on the model. So uh, there are many examples uh, of things that neural networks are used for. And here we're talking about regression. So one example here is a neural network, uh, which we'll see a little bit later on. Um, uh, we'll see uh, something similar to this later on in the interactive session. This could be a model that could predict the total energy of a one-dimensional system to solve the Schrodinger equation. So, for example, on the left here, uh, you can imagine the external potential on a real space grid. So, this, for example, would be the uh, every uh, point here will be the external potential of your system. And on the right here will be the total energy of the system. So the external potential you would feed in and it would propagate through all of these weights and biases until you get the one value at the edge at the end, which would be your total energy of the system. If you then had many examples of external potentials and energies, uh, you could train the weights of this network um, via gradient descent. So that given a new external um, potential, you can predict new energies. And this is something we'll be doing in the interactive session. It's worth noting, you'll see here, there's like a huge number of parameters. Um, and you could worry, well, isn't this very easy for you to overfit to your data? As you know, if you're doing simple one-dimensional regression with, for example, polynomials, you can always choose a polynomial of high enough uh, freedom that essentially zigzags exactly through all of your data points and gets an error of exactly zero for all of your data, which you'd be very happy with. Um, but then if you wanted to predict a new data point, you'd know it'd be wildly, wildly inaccurate. Um, and this is particularly uh, an issue for neural networks because of the sheer number of parameters that they have because the relationship is so complex. And so to avoid uh, overfitting, um, originally the idea was to split your data into training and testing data. So what they did is they took some training data that you used to train the model. Um, uh, so for example, here you would, you would take your external potentials and energies and you train it on those, but you test it on some separate data that is unseen to the network. So you adjust your, your, um, uh, your parameters through gradient descent, and you make sure that when you apply your model to the uh, training data it was given, and then to some unseen test data, that the errors seem roughly the same. As soon as the training error starts to fall dramatically below your testing error, you know you're starting to overfit because the model is successfully reducing the error on the, on the data it's seeing, but making no further improvement on unseen data. This is a good idea. And then what you can do is you can then use this to adjust to the hyperparameters of your model. So what are the hyperparameters? So the parameters are these red and green lines here, the weights, but the hyperparameters are what you choose the model to be. For example, how many layers there are in the network. In this case, there are three hidden layers. Uh, how many new, uh, nodes in each of the hidden layers? What is your activation function, et cetera? And so what people would do is they would then uh, go, oh, on our test data, we've got a good result. Let's now improve our model by maybe adding a layer to the neural network. Maybe we'll change our activation function. Maybe we'll change how we do our gradient descent. And they got better results on the test set. And they repeated this and repeated this and got great improvement. And the improvement on the test set increased, increased. Then they deployed it in the real world and it did no good. And the reason for this is the test set in this case has as, as a bled somehow onto the training set via the, the, the human that's, that's doing this optimization of the network. Because in this case, if you think about it like this, the human is one stage of the machine learning process who is also overfitting to the test set. So as the human is updating the hyperparameters for the test set, it's getting better and better, but is now also overfitting to the test set, not via the parameter tuning, but via the hyperparameter tuning of what models we use. So a common approach now is to have three data sets. You have your um, training data, validation data and testing data. And so as before, you use your training and validation um, uh, data to, to, to make sure there's no overfitting. So you, you train on the training data and the validation data you, you check, which is data that the, the, the model doesn't see. Uh, and then you improve your model and improve your model till the validation data gets lower and lower. And then only once, and really only once, you apply your model to the test set, which is not seen by the model or by the human training the model. 
And so when the, the model is applied to the test set once and only once, that is your definitive result. And then you are no longer allowed to make further modifications. So for example, if you're comparing five different types of neural networks, you would train and do a training validation test on all five of them separately. You'd be confident you'd got all five of them as good as you possibly could. And then one time only, you'd apply all five to the test set and use this to compare which model is, is better than the other because they have been compared once against unseen data to everyone in the process. Okay, so I've talked about what, what I just talked about here is something called dense neural networks or, or multi-layer perceptrons. A perceptron is just the terminology for a neuron as in multiple layers of neurons. Um, well, these networks um, aren't used so commonly uh, for certain tasks. And why is this? So let's say one task we wanted to solve was uh, image recognition. So we have some um, handwritten digit here, some pixelated photograph of a, of a digit. And we want to identify as the uh, output of the model is what digit is drawn in this image. In this case, the answer will be zero. What we could do is we could get every pixel of this image and feed it into the input of a, of a neural network um, of the inputs equal to the number of pixels. And the output would be uh, 10 values, as in the probability of each value being in the image, so zero to nine. The problem with this is the neural network would have to be highly complicated because the neural network considers the full correlation, as in every, every layer, it depends on every previous layer. If we go back to the previous slide, we see that every neuron is connected to every layer in the previous. And this means it doesn't exploit any spatial properties. The neural network considers two pixels that are next to each other with exactly the same um, importance as two pixels that are the opposite side of the image to each other. So a convolutional network asks, wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow exploit the locality or the spatial properties of this image, knowing that parts of the image that are close to each other have more importance than parts of the image that are far away from each other. And this is what convolutional networks do. So what is a convolution? Well, let's say we have a, a input image on the left of, uh, of, of pixels, um, and we uh, pick a kernel, which is this, um, uh, this, this, blue, this blue set of values here. And so this kernel, what we do is we uh, put it on one of the pixels and we just do a simple multiplication. So we take all of the top nine values and multiply separately by the nine values in the image below, uh, which is padded with zeros here, for example. And we calculate one value, which we put as the value of the uh, output here. We then slide to the next one and repeat the process and repeat the process. And so essentially what this is, is telling us is uh, in this image, how much of this diagonal nature is in the image. So the, uh, the, the output on the right somehow becomes more activated when the uh, image more closely correlates with the, with the kernel value. So you see here, there's this diagonal uh, line in the image here that when it aligns, we see we get a very dark or a very activated uh, level of the neuron here, suggesting, uh, uh, telling the model that, oh, in this image, this a kernel of this type, this, this, this blue um, uh, uh, grid of numbers here, is somehow highly represented in the image here, whereas less um, in, in the rest of the images. And so this is one convolution. So if you have your input, like this handwritten digit I showed before, and you pick a kernel and you do one convolution, you then get another output image, which would end up looking like this. We can then reduce the dimensions of this image because here we've done one convolution, but we haven't really distilled the information down in a simple form. So you do a method called pooling, where, for example, this is a method called maximum pooling, where you just basically take the, the largest value in each uh, two by two area to reduce the size of the image. So now we have an image that in some general way tells us that, oh, there is diagonals somewhere in the center of the image and somewhere in the bottom left of the image. So I can show another example here of this being done for the handwritten digit itself. So on the left here, we have this, uh, this six and the kernel we choose is this uh, diagonal, um, diagonal value. And we'll see as this scans over the image uh, on the right hand side, um, neurons will be activated that uh, show some diagonal nature in the image. So for example, at the top and the bottom part of the six, you'll start to get some activation. Um, and then you can do this with many kernels. So you don't have to just do this with the one uh, uh, I've shown here. You could do it with many to get many different output images. And then the question is, well, okay, um, I, everything seems to make sense. I put in my input image, I get out an output image, I then pull it to make it smaller. I repeat until I get to one value that I can use to make my prediction. But where do these kernels come from? Where do these blue, um, blue objects come from? And these are the parameters of the model, just like the weights and biases, the red and green lines in the neural network are the parameters you train. In this case, it is these blue values here, these kernel values that you train. So you start with these as really random kernels, 
And then the neural network uses BRAC propagation to adjust the values of these kernels to make the predictions. So next we can see what a common convolution neural network for image classification might look like. Um, so this could be to predict the, the probability of, an ob, uh, of, a, of the digit in the image. So on the uh, first, you take in your, your uh, image, then you pick one kernel and apply it to get another image. Then you pick it another kernel, apply it, get another image and repeat. In this case, we have three kernels. So we have three output images. We then perform some pooling step to reduce the size of the image. Then we repeat this for layer after layer after layer. And then eventually we would just flatten the values. So we just take the, the remaining values and just, just make them flat and then end the network with a much smaller dense neural network. And the advantage of this is this has far, far fewer parameters, orders of magnitude fewer parameters than the neural network we saw before, uh, which means that the uh, the, 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 the time uh, to required to train is much slower. The amount of data needed to train is much slower. The risk of overfitting and, and, and non-generalization is much lower. And also this is because it fundamentally exploits the spatial structure in the data rather than treating everything separately. So this we want uh, application of this is you have this handwritten digits um, and applying training a convolutional network I just showed below on this image can give you um, a very large 99% accuracy of classifying the image. So this is some predictions made on some test set of the given uh, photograph of the image with what um, it, digit is detected in the image. And uh, later on, this is actually one example uh, we will use um, in, in, in the interactive session this afternoon, training convolutional networks on this handwritten digit example. So this is something you can try yourselves. Yeah. There is a, uh, a question here by Tash. Yep. Okay, how do you choose the kernel? Is it some object? Yeah, exactly. So this kernel here that we've chosen. Um, if your question is, how do we choose this uh, initially? We start with a random kernel. We really choose here, we would choose nine random values as the kernel. And this would give us, as we propagate through this diagram, it would give us some prediction. This prediction would be wrong. But then we would use back propagation to improve the values of the kernel. And we would repeat this until the values of the kernel are chosen such that the, the network gives a good prediction. So you can think of the kernel in this case as being analogous to the uh, gradient and y-intercept of the linear model. The kernels are, are initialized randomly and are chosen by a back propagation given the data set um, such that give a good prediction. And what's interesting about this is that uh, is the weights and biases are actually very hard to interpret for a dense neural network. They are just all of these values. But what, because this is spatially based, these kernels um, you can then look at after you've trained your model. So if you have, a, for example, a, the, the facial recognition models that perform very well, if you look at the kernels, they end up looking like little eyes, little noses, little two dots, little parts of faces. And the, the, the initial kernels in the network are usually something very, very general, like some like circle with two dots to be a face or something like this. And then as the network gets smaller and smaller, it becomes like eyes, facial features and things like this. So by looking at the trained kernels at the end, you can really get some insight is how the model is making its prediction. So for example, if the, the kernel looks like an eye, it will scan over the image and be like, oh, there are two of these, two blobs will um, line up. And then as that propagates forward, um, which is why the model can be much simpler because the kernels really have some, some, some more intrinsic meaning. So convolutions doesn't have to be uh, 2D. You can also do 1D convolutions by having a, a one-dimensional kernel and sliding it over your image. And an example we'll do in the interactive session uh, um, uh, later on this afternoon is for um, solving the Schrodinger equation. So here we have some one-dimensional model systems where we have some external potentials, which is the dotted line, um, and some densities, and then some total energies. Um, and you can train a convolutional neural network on this model to take in the uh, external potential of the system and produce the energy. Um, using one dimensional convolutions. Uh, and this is the example we'll be doing this afternoon. It's worth noting one thing we find an interesting result that we can learn even for this simple case is if you get uh, a very standard model and train the energy as a functional of the uh, external potential, um, the model has very nice training and, and, and doesn't overfit and makes very good predictions. And if you get that exact same model and try and learn the energy as a function of the density, it performs very poorly. It's extremely difficult. So this, for example, is what is an indication that it's somehow uh, simpler to learn uh, the energy as a function of the potential for these one electron systems. And there's some intuition and, and we investigate this a little more in the interactive session. Um, so then, for example, if I had a new system, uh, then, for example, this little stretched H2 uh, model, one dimensional model molecule, you could then apply this external potential uh, into your network. Uh, and then the prediction uh, is shown in, in, in red uh, compared to the exact result, which is in, in, in cyan. And we see it gives a good, uh, good result. And of course, this is very different shape to the, the training systems. The training systems are these randomly varying um, 
potentials based on Fourier, Fourier series, whereas this uh, external potential of these two atoms, it still performs well, which shows the model has generalized well beyond this training set. Okay, so uh, next I'll talk about some classification. So let's say we want to perform a classification uh, from a, a set of uh, images where we simply want to know the probability that there is a particular object in the image, for example, a digit. So this is going to be a value between zero and one is the output of our model, which is the probability we predict there is, a, there is an object in the image. And this is our data set, these, these blue dots. So we see that for each image, either the, there is an object in their image or there isn't. So it's either a zero or a one. And so we can fit a, a sigmoid function to this. Um, and this is a method called logistic regression. We would fit a function using gradient descent. So we'd start with some function like this, that's random, and then use gradient descent to adjust the parameters of this uh, curve until we more closely make correct predictions based on the data. And this would mean if we had a new image, for example, somewhere here on the X value, we could predict the probability uh, between zero and one of an object being in that image. And this is a, a method of classification that doesn't use neural networks. So you see, this is a, this is a simpler case. If you want to do binary classification, where the, pro the, the output value of your model is just something between zero and one. So this is a logistic regression, an example of machine learning that is not, not deep learning. So you can use this to perform an experiment. So for example, let's say we fitted our logistic regression model to some data like this. Uh, what we could do is um, use the, a Monte Carlo method. So first we do the logistic regression, we have some data. Um, uh, the, the application I talk about here is, is hospital data. So on the X, you have some parameters of a, of a, of a person coming into your hospital. Uh, and on the Y is the probability they, is whether they require certain treatment that costs a certain amount of money. So each of these, uh, th th these people here, um, either had, don't require treatment or do require treatment. Uh, and you fit a logistic regression curve to predict, given a new person that comes into your, your hospital, whether you'll need to give them treatment. And you want to know over a given period of time uh, how much money you, should, you, you would expect uh, uh, to pay. So, um, yeah, so, for, so let's say you predicted you know, 10,000 people arriving and you have data on them. Uh, you, you, you select the, the person, let's say they were over here, and you pick the probability they'll need treatment. So let's say it'd be 0.6 here and you randomize the outcome. So you really roll a dice, you generate a random number. And if it's above 0.6, you, you assume you would give them treatment and sign them a value of one. And if it's below 0.6, you assume you don't give them treatment and give them a value of zero. And then you say, okay, so for this person, we would require treatment. So we need to add the price of, of the treatment. And you'd repeat this for all of the possible people until you'd say, okay, over this month, uh, for this particular simulation, we would expect to give so many people treatment, which has cost us so much. You then repeat this process over and over again, um, where of course each time you're generating new random numbers. So sometimes a person with probability 0.5 ends up needing treatment and sometimes they don't. Um, and then you can use this to, to not just build a model, but to build a statistical distribution of what you expect it to cost you. So you could say, if I want to be safe 95% of the time, I should allocate this much money, which means in a 95% probability, we'll have enough money to treat, to treat all the patients. So this is an example of using logistic regression for classification. Um, uh, uh, to make some prediction using a Monte Carlo method. There's also some of the examples here. Okay, so the next um, part of machine learning I'll talk about, which is coming up in a talk later today by Andrea, is um, compression. Because as we'll discuss, compression and constraints are very similar things. So in machine learning, often we want to try to compress data. Now we know of common compression algorithms like ZIP or JPEG, for example, and these are non-generalized um, compression methods. For example, zip is very general. It can, be, it can be applied to any file or a JPEG, just a sub image. But machine learning, we'd like to ask, given a data set, can I build a custom compression method for just this data set I have? So let's say I have a thousand images of these handwritten digits. I want to make a way I can compress these handwritten digits to a small value possible, that when I decompress them, I recover as much information as possible. And so I could use something like a zip or a JPEG, but that really wouldn't exploit the constraints in the image. If the data set is only handwritten digits, there is really some additional compression you can do, which I'll explain in a moment. And one example of this is principal component analysis. So if I have some data points here on the top, these blue data points, um, uh, we can perform principal component analysis, which essentially chooses the two basis vectors, this one and two, such that the first basis vector goes along the direction of most variation in the data. So you see one goes along this kind of diagonal of the data. And then the second component is the second most um, 
a variation of the data. In this case, there's only two dimensions of the data, so there's only two uh, components. And so you'd say the, the value one is the principal component, and then value two is the second most principal component, and so on. And when we transform into this uh, new basis set shown down here by simply doing a linear rotation, if we now threw away or disregarded the, the, the y value, the value of the, the axis two, we would only lose a small amount of data. We'd lose the smallest amount of data possible. Whereas if it was in this top basis here, we performed the compression by just um, uh, uh, removing the, the y value, um, the, the prediction would be very wrong. So here we're asking uh, which, which components of this data are they most important? And therefore, if we remove the lower components, we um, remove less data. One example of this principal component analysis or, or an equivalent method is um, using Fourier transforms to do um, uh, filtering of data. So, you, so one example of, of components would be the Fourier, the Fourier transform. So you could Fourier transform your data, remove the very high frequency noise and transform back. And in this case, you've thrown away data, but thrown away data that has the least impact. Um, this Fourier uh, this Fourier transform way of doing it is one example, but it's not custom to your data set. It's just a general method. What the PCA does is it builds a method similar to the, to the filtering in Fourier transforms, but customized exactly for your data set. So when thinking about compression, um, a method that's used um, uh, is autoencoders. And compression, with autoencoders, you can usually compress data by a very, very large amount. And this sometimes causes people to think that you've lost some data. But often you can really compress data to a smaller amount without losing a lot of, without losing any information based on how constrained the data is. So for example, on the left here, if I have these 10 random values, and I asked you to write a compression method, that if you take these 10 values, you reduce them to as small as possible, such that you can reproduce all the 10 values exactly. It'd be very difficult if these were just 10 random numbers. You could maybe say, okay, what I can do is if there's a, a, a value repeated, like these fours, I could put four times three or something. So if there's lots of repeated values, it becomes a smaller amount. But really with random uh, information, you'd really find it hard to write, a, to write a method to compress this where you could reproduce all the information. But if the data was highly constrained, so I told you that the data that you have is always even integers, that is always in descending order, that always sums to 10, you could then say, ah, well, I can just take this first value because from the constraints, I can reconstruct everything. Because if I know this value is eight and they're even the descending order and they sum to 10, the only possible next value is two and therefore the only next possible next value is zero. And so this is also a form of completely lossless compression a very high amount of lossless compression that is possible due to how constrained the data is. And so our data set, for example, of handwritten digits is far more constrained than all possible images. So if you use, for example, a JPEG to compress your image, this is designed to work for any possible image, but you could say, ah, well, if I have these handwritten digits, maybe it's more closer to the second case. Maybe it can be really, really finely compressed because there isn't all the possible variations that could be in this image. You know, there's no like tree or face or something that will be in this image. These aren't possible. So of all of these possible randomness that's eliminated, we can really do more compression. And autoencoders do this task for you. So autoencoders are essentially neural networks. So for example, let's say we have a dense neural network. I'm just using an example here for simplicity. But on the left, we have the pixels of our image. And on the right, we have the pixels of our image. And it's simply a neural network that along the way from the input to the output image goes to a smaller amount of data. So here you'd have your number of pixels on the left, but down to just four values and then see number of pixels again. And so what you do is you train this model not to produce some prediction, but to produce the same output as its input. So you put your image on the left and also ask it to reproduce the image on the right. If the neural network managed to do this with high accuracy, uh, it would mean that you could take the left half of the network and use this as a, as a compressor. So you could take your values, you reduce it down to the four values and you store it in your database. When you want to recover the value, you put the four values as the input to your decompressor, which is the right-hand side, and you reproduce your input image. And by reducing the size of this uh, layer in the middle, you can improve your compression. This is something we'll also do in the interactive session uh, later today. Um, I'm just checking for time. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to skip this uh, density matrix. OK, and so one final example. Um, that I thought I'd use is this computer, some computer vision technique. Uh, for example, used to detect lines in an image. So in this example, let's say we have some, um, you know, let's say you're designing some self-driving car and you have some camera on the front of your car and you want to draw on this image where the lines are, the left and right lines. 
you don't exactly know what color the lines will be, you don't exactly know what the lighting is, but you'd like it with accuracy and this image to draw on the, the line at the left of the, of the car and the right of the car. So one thing you, you, you do first is some pre-processing. So first of all, you would um, uh, grayscale the image um, and then uh, perform some edge detection, which is simply by taking gradients. So you take a, a gradient in the X direction, a gradient in the Y direction, and you square them and add them up. So essentially, you'd highlight above a threshold which pixels have the most change. So for example, the parts of the center of the road had no gradient as it was a constant color. And so you'd highlight these edges here. That's quite a simple thing to do. And then also you could apply some cutoff uh, where you throw away some part of the image because you know where the lanes would be in the image. But let's say you have these points now. This is a series of points on this black background. And you want to basically detect what are lines, what are straight lines, and what is not. And this seems quite difficult, but there's a method called the, so yeah, to do this. So we want to draw these lines in the image based just on these values. So perform some method that can detect two lines on this image, the left and right. Now the method here is called a, a Huff transform, where what you do um, is you represent your, um, uh, your points in something configuration space. So what does that mean? So let's say, for example, we have a point in X and Y. So one of these, uh, oh, sorry, a line in X and Y. So a line of these points like we saw here. Um, that can be represented in configuration space by just its Y intercept and its gradient. So this line corresponds to exactly one point in the configuration space, given the Y intercept C and the gradient M. And so every possible line in our real space is represented by one point in configuration space. And now we could ask, okay, but what if we have a point in real space? What does that correspond to? In configuration space and the answer is the inverse it's a line now this isn't exactly obvious so why is this why does this one point define just this line well you can think of it as all possible lines that go through this point so on, on the right here this um this line with a gradient of zero and y intercept 2.5 goes to this point and then you can think of going along all of the possible lines that go exactly through this green point we have which defines this gray line on the right so this one green point maps only to this one gray line. And so let's say we have the case um, uh, in our image. So we have all of these, these white dots on our black background, which were produced from the method shown before. We want to ask, is there any lines in this image? Well, we can convert each of these green points into their corresponding line. So they're all lines. And we see there is almost no intersection. No two points seem to share somehow a part of configuration space. So in this, you would say we detect no lines in this image. And let's say we had another case where the, the, the data points were more in, in a similar line. So for example, like this, and then we calculate each of the gray lines in configuration space corresponding to each of them. We see they map, they all overlap and congest in some area with a gradient of, uh, of one and a y-intercept of two. And you see that there is approximately a line here with a gradient of one and y-intercept of two. And so we could use that for every frame of this image to draw these draw these lines on this uh, on this image, where in each case, we're using the edge detection to get all of these white dot edges, and then simply applying the Huff transform to get these, these uh, lane lines, which would usually by some manual coding method would be a very, very difficult task, and it's uh, fairly robust. So this is one example of, uh, of uh, machine learning being applied to computer vision tasks, like in this case, lane detection for a car. Okay, so I'm all finished now. So to summarize, um, I've gone over four key aspects of, um, of, of machine learning. So uh, regression, classification, compression, and computer vision. Um, in the regression, we learned how you can use uh, linear regression, neural networks, convolutional neural networks to make predictions um, based on some data. Um, uh, the, and they build a model based on some data that you can use to make predictions. For example, what objects are in images, predicting energies from external potentials, and so on. Uh, next looks at classification of how you could build probabilities of, um, of, of, of objects and use Monte Carlo simulation um, to produce a model of the world that allows you to make predictions of things like costs. Also looking at um, on the bottom left, uh, compression. So how you can use neural networks or autoencoders um, to compress data um, in order for you to learn how the data is constrained or to exploit how the data is constrained, which is useful in building uh, in, in physics applications, learning constraints of objects. And then finally, some computer vision of how you can use some um, interesting transformation techniques to find objects in images that would usually be quite difficult or capture some underlying patterns in images that is otherwise not obvious. So these are the methods we've covered now and various of these, such as the convolutional network, uh, image classification and compression uh, will be applied um, in the uh, session this afternoon, the, uh, uh, the session using Python.
where we can build a image classifier, an image compressor, and then a, a method that solves a, a neural network that solves the Schrodinger equation for some simple model systems, and then try to improve those improve those models. So I think I'm out of time. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jack, for the thorough introduction. Um, uh, so the, now the session is open for uh, for question. Uh, well, we have already one, so I will give the the priority to this one, and then everybody. So uh, Hashna Jose already asked uh, this. Maybe so you can have a look. Yeah, can back propagation be compared to active learning in Suto? Um, I've not heard this term, active learning. Maybe, yeah. maybe I can comment on this. So, and back back propagation just means that you, I mean, use the gradients of your loss function with respect to your parameters to update your network or whatever model you have. And active learning uh, means um, that you uh, don't have a fixed um, training set, but um, you have a training set and then want to figure out which um, systems or which pictures might be the best to um, improve your um, learning performance. And so you have some uncertainty, for example, or some um, way to determine, okay, and this picture should be added to the training set and in this way you improve. And so, yeah, and no, it's not really related, although you can use gradients from back propagation for active learning. Okay, other questions? But in the meantime, while everybody's figuring out what questions to ask, uh, did you use uh, three blue one browns animation library? Oh, to make the slides? Yes. Yeah, the library is called Manny, so okay. Python library to make like maths animation. Okay, it's really nice. Yeah, three blue one browns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. A little time into it. Yeah, I could figure it out. But it was really nice that you sort of showed examples which kind of were intuitive enough. Okay. Maybe one question, Jack. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, again, more towards the question of convolution. So you always, when you do these operations, be it 1D or in 2D, you always have some problems while you're in the boundary? Yeah. And how do you deal with that? Yeah, so there's different methods of dealing with the edge. One is uh, where you pad the edge. So you add zero to the edge of your, uh, your system or any value. Sometimes it can be the mean of your data. Often for images, it's zero. Um, to add your data, um, or, or you can not go to the edge of the image. You can make your convolution start a pixel more close to the center so that the edge of the convolution lines up with the edge of the image. And this is called the, the, the valid method. So you only scan across pixels that are valid. You never go off the edge. But this means that your output of your convolution is slightly smaller than the input of your convolution. So there are two different priorities. If you use valid, then you have no error due to your padding. But your dimensions of your uh, image as you go through convolutions get slightly, slightly smaller. But well, if you do pad the image, this means your output image is exactly the same size as the input image, but you have to choose some value to pad with. So those are the two ways of doing it. And there's a trade-off between which method you choose based on your application. Okay. And so, so if I understood correctly, when you do this back, back propagation, is it somehow um, trying to find some self-consistency in finding the convolution uh, or the kernel, the kernel of the convolution? Can we say it like this? Yes, yeah, so it's trying to find consistency between the predictions made given some kernels and the data set. Okay, okay. So, so there so your let's say, stopping the, criteria would be how good your predictions are. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that gradient is used to update the, the, the values inside the kernel. Okay. And eventually, as, your, as the model converges, the kernel values will no longer change, and those are your final converged kernels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, in your example for the um, uh, decoder and encoder, mm. for the compression, and mm. uh, how symmetric is the algorithm? Or they are completely different uh, kind of neural networks to, 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 to implement? Yeah, that's a good point. So often, um, the, the decoder side of things is exactly the inverse of the encoder in the sense that you have it symmetric. So the example I showed there was a dense neural network. The number of neurons on the left and right are the same. And then even the layers. 
Exactly, mm -hmm. and the number of layers, the number of neurons, the weights won't necessarily won't be the same, but the shape, the shape of the neural network is symmetric. Now, this is something that is done as it seems to work better, but there's no reason to. Your encoder and decoder could be, in principle, very different. They're very different networks, and you connect them and you train the whole thing. But in practice, it seems to be that using convolutions and deconvolutions, where deconvolution is just the inverse operation, uh, or a set of um, a set of uh, dense layers getting smaller and the same number increasing, but there'll be no requirement of why it would necessarily have to be. It's not mathematical uh, demonstration no. that this must no, be no. like that. No, just a practical assumption and a practical experience that that's the best way to do. Okay, are there questions from the audience outside this room? If there is none, probably I will ask one again. It's, Go ahead. It's more about the, um, the example of um, Schrodinger equation solution that you said. So basically, what is the input of your of your neural network? It's like a value of a potential at different x point or different potentials? Different value at every x point. So one data point is one whole system where the, the inputs to the network is the value of uh, the external potential at every x point. So let's say you had 100 grid points in your calculation, your network would have 100 inputs. So you okay. draw your external potential, you would write it on the grid and each of these 100 values you'd insert into the network. And then the output of the network would be the prediction of the energy. So there'd be more input neurons based on how many grid points you had in your system. And um, if it was a simple thing like a Hubbard system, it would be far fewer, but if it was a real space, you could have thousands of input neurons. Um, and then each one of these data points, which is an external potential map to energy of one of these systems, each of those will be used to train the system. So you would then have maybe, a, in the example we have this afternoon, we have like 100,000 external potentials and energies, and you'd use this data set to adjust the weights of your model, so that when you give it a new external potential, like this stretch, stretch molecule, it gives you a good prediction of the total energy. And this is why there are n inputs for n grid points, and one output, because the total energy just has one, one value. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, there is a question from Andreas, please. Thank you. Um, there is, uh, I understand that uh, there is a um, uh, large variety of models that can be produced because of the fle flexibility. And uh, also there is an uncertainty that we can live with when we produce some data for example, when you take a look at a picture, well, like, well, said with the compressor, so just some information can be lost. But in general, in physics, I want the energy, solve the Schrodinger equation with a number of digits. I don't want uh, uh, 55 digits or something like that. Not if the computer will let me to do it, goes far enough or so. And understand the distinction between these models also is finally made by testing. Future will tell us if it's if it's right or wrong. Is it not a waste of energy to proceed this way? Maybe these criteria can be built in before. When you say, when I work to a certain uncertainty, just can reduce a number of parameters. Yeah. Just, just in the process of construction to say, well, it's worthless to continue there. Yeah, this is, is, this, this, is yeah, yeah, this is definitely something we've looked at, and particularly, as you say, calculating observables. Because let's say, for example, in one example, I think Andrea will speak about later today, is let's say you're machine learning the density matrix, for example. You say, oh, how accurate does my density matrix need to be? You know, do I want the 10 digits of every single value of x and x prime? And then you say, well, I want to calculate an observable from this density matrix, let's say the kinetic energy or the exchange energy, for example. So maybe you find out that the uh, density matrix doesn't have to be so good to give you a very accurate kinetic energy. And what um, there's, there's techniques in machine learning where you can ask for a given model that's trained which parts of the input are most uh, would sorry for a given output which parts of the input is most sensitive so which input which parts of the density matrix would i have to change to have a smaller change on the kinetic energy to somehow highlight what part of it is the uh, the density matrix is the most important to get a given observable and then let's only optimize for that quantity rather than the whole quantity and so this asks, you really produces two questions of what should the form of the input be? So, for example, should we give the machine as the input the density matrix or maybe the gradient of the density matrix or the second derivative of the density matrix? 
And then what do we want to optimize for at the output? Do we want some mean sum of the value of every x and x prime? Or do we have a custom model for each observable? So the kinetic energy, such that when you look at the density matrix, maybe it's not so good, but because of the so many integrations, it, the, 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 the errors cancel somehow, and you, and you can produce your accurate observable. So yeah, so whenever trading one of these models, you really don't want to waste your time and end up optimizing for a quantity that you don't want in the future. And this is by a careful choice of the way you present the input and then what um, quantity you use to define your loss or to, to determine your error. Um, and this can end up having, where you have a neural network, for example, for every observable, maybe for the kinetic energy and for the exchange energy, the, the quality that the density matrix must have, must have may be completely different. Okay, thank you. Okay. I don't see any immediate question. Um, do you have uh, any uh, particular instruction besides what is written in the website for this afternoon? Because we will have to 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 just download the the files yeah. and yeah and, yeah and follow the instruction essentially exactly you can, and you don't have to do anything beforehand you can try it to make some progress but you don't have to do anything beforehand it's simply you just clone from the git repository to get the get everything and then it's just one command to install the dependencies in python and then you can do the things so yeah and you will do it also as well exactly okay this afternoon i'll do it to set up everything 